communist China under Mao Zedong, the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin, Nazi Germany under Adolf Hitler. Throughout history, authoritarian regimes have inflicted oppression, extortion, enslavement, terrorism, torture, and murder upon innocent people. Many Americans firmly believe and confidently proclaim that such a thing could never happen in the United States. But is this just wishful thinking? Or is there something fundamentally different about the United States that renders it immune to the tyrannical oppression that has plagued every other major empire in history? The first step in analyzing the claim that it can't happen here is to identify and define what it is. Many people have an oversimplified, almost comic book type view of tyranny, an image of the obviously malicious dictator wringing his hands while cackling maniacally about ruling the world. In the real world, tyranny has always come about under the guise of defending the nation, protecting the people, and creating law and order. To gain power, a tyrant, at least to begin with, needs the support of the people. A successful tyrant cannot openly exhibit malice and lust for power, but must craft his message so as to convince the people that his intentions are noble, that he wants truth and justice to prevail, and that the way to make that happen is to give him power and control. Authoritarian regimes grow by exploiting people's fears, worries about economic troubles, crime, foreign invaders, and so on, and convincing the people that the solution is for a political leader to be given total control so he can protect the people from the evils of the world. This is always the template out of which tyranny grows. No matter how repressive or brutal a regime becomes, those in power will continue to claim good intentions and will insist that extraordinary government powers are necessary to protect the people and to create justice and order. Throughout history, every time humanity has taken a step away from freedom and towards tyranny, it was done in the name of serving and protecting the nation and the people. But because every candidate, every political party, every regime claims to be for peace and freedom, for truth and justice, for protecting the innocent and defeating the wicked, how can the potential tyrants be recognized and kept out of power? Every tyrant claims to have noble motives, insists that the people should trust him, and promises to use his power for good. Finding the truth, therefore, requires one to look past a politician's words and to focus instead on his actions. There are several basic philosophical principles which tyrants always seek to undermine and destroy. In any country, determining whether these principles are being respected or violated indicates whether that country is headed towards tyranny, or is already there. Historically speaking, it is a relatively new concept to suggest that there are limits to what rulers may do to their people. The Magna Carta, 800 years ago, expressed the radical idea that even the king should be subject to certain restrictions. Subsequent English law, and later the U.S. Constitution, specifically described certain things that those in power can never have the right to do. Several examples of this are found in the first ten amendments to the U.S. Constitution, collectively known as the Bill of Rights. This would include freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom from unreasonable searches and seizures, freedom from being forced to testify against oneself, the right to be armed, the right of an accused to a trial by a jury of his peers, and so on. The Bill of Rights did not claim to create any of these rights, but instead identified such rights as inherent to humanity, pre-existing and outranking all man-made authority of any kind. 
rights that should never be violated, even if the majority supports such violations, and even if those in power claim that such violations are urgently necessary and are being done with the best of intentions. The authors of the Bill of Rights were well aware that once these principles are abandoned, the end result will always be unbridled tyranny. With that in mind, we will examine several of these fundamental principles to see where they have been respected and where they have been violated. The U.S. Constitution describes a very restricted, limited role for the federal government to play. The Ninth and Tenth Amendments, the last two in the Bill of Rights, declare not just that there are some things the federal government may not do, but that it may not do anything except for what is clearly and specifically authorized by the Constitution. Congress was not intended to have the power to control, regulate, or prohibit whatever it wished, but to have power only over certain specific matters. Such a concept cannot be found in the founding documents of the notorious tyrannies in history. On paper, this would seem to be a fundamental difference between the United States and many other regimes. But has that difference translated into reality? The federal law books today are full of thousands of pages of laws imposing taxation, regulation, and sometimes criminalization of matters which the Constitution never put under federal jurisdiction, including education, health care, food, retirement plans, caring for the poor, air travel, trains, cars, alcohol, tobacco, drugs, firearms, explosives, gambling, communications, employment practices, farming, wildlife, and all manner of production and manufacturing. In order to acquire and maintain power over such matters, politicians appointed judges to manufacture legal excuses for ignoring the constitutional limits on federal power. Of note, the Constitution itself does not say that the courts are the ultimate deciders of what is or is not constitutional. Nonetheless, shortly after the Constitution was written, the U.S. Supreme Court simply declared itself to be the ultimate judge of constitutionality. Since then, the federal courts have gradually whittled away at the concept of limited powers, fabricating justifications and rationalizations for violating the principle. One significant example occurred in 1942, when the Supreme Court ruled that Congress could regulate and control a farmer growing and consuming his own wheat on his own property under the Interstate Commerce Clause of the Constitution. The outrageous rationale was that the farmer growing and consuming his own wheat, though such activity is neither interstate nor is it commerce, might have an indirect impact on interstate commerce because if the farmer had not grown his own wheat, he might have purchased wheat elsewhere, which might have traveled through interstate commerce if he had. And so, with the obvious premeditated intention of drastically expanding federal power, the court simply manufactured a new legal excuse for putting nearly everyone and everything under federal control. Recently, the Supreme Court fabricated another new legal principle out of thin air to allow President Obama to force citizens to purchase private health insurance. As a result, Congress can now not only tax, regulate, control, and forbid anything it pleases, but can even force citizens to spend their own money on certain products or services, bringing to an end even the flimsiest facade of a federal government of limited powers. Both major political parties have enacted legislation far beyond anything the Constitution ever authorized, while continuing to appoint judges who will give their blessing to such actions. And this has often occurred with public approval, by people more interested in the promise of being protected and taken care of than they are in the fundamental principles of freedom. Ultimately, the American politician and the American voter have cooperated to completely destroy one of the primary checks against tyranny. The next obstacle to tyranny to examine is the concept of due process, which dictates that when the state intends to take someone's property or freedom, 
It may not do so arbitrarily, but may do so only by way of the legislative process. Providing individuals with an opportunity to challenge the claims and actions of the government at an open and fair hearing before a neutral judge. And in criminal cases, the government may not punish people based on mere accusations or suspicions, but must provide evidence sufficient to convince a jury of his peers beyond a reasonable doubt that the accused has violated the law. While the Fifth Amendment mentions the right to due process, merely having such words on paper does not necessarily mean the principle will be adhered to in the real world. Indeed, similar concepts contained in the constitutions of Red China and the Soviet Union failed to stop those authoritarian regimes from murdering millions of human beings without charges or trial. The constitution of the Weimar Republic, the government of Germany preceding Hitler's rise to power, was very thorough regarding the concept of due process, saying, quote, The rights of the individual are inviolable. Limitation or deprivation of individual liberty is admissible only if based on laws. Persons deprived of their liberty have to be notified at the next day on the latest by which authority and based on which reasons the deprivation of their liberty has been ordered. Immediately, they have to be given the opportunity to protest against the deprivation of liberty. Technically, the Weimar Constitution was still in effect during Nazi reign. However, Article 48 of that Constitution provided that, in cases of national emergency, the government could suspend nearly all civil rights, including the right to due process. The idea that a government may not do certain things unless it decides to give itself permission to, in the name of some emergency, obviously contradicts the concept of unalienable rights. And though the U.S. Constitution does not authorize anyone to suspend the principle of due process, the U.S. government has spent decades fabricating excuses for circumventing and undermining the principle. The violations are not so blatant and drastic as those committed by the Soviet, Chinese, and Nazi governments, but are still significant. For example, by way of asset seizure laws relating to drug prohibition, federal and state governments in the U.S. now directly confiscate all sorts of property, cash, cars, boats, houses, and so on, that is merely alleged to be related to profits from the drug trade, without a warrant or court order, and without having to prove anything. In some cases, simply possessing a large enough amount of cash is, by itself, grounds for government agents to steal it, without the need for any trial, charges, warrant, or even any reasonable suspicion of criminal activity. Then there is the concept of eminent domain, whereby the government can simply take private property for its own uses. The government is required to provide just compensation for private property it takes, with the government deciding what counts as just, and until recently, private property could only be taken for public use, meaning government purposes. That changed in 2005, when the Supreme Court proclaimed that governments could take private property from one person and give it to another, based solely on the likelihood that doing so might create jobs and increase the government's tax revenues. Now any government, federal, state, or local, can forcibly take any piece of property from one person and give it to another on the claim that doing so might help the economy. One of the most widespread violations of due process can be seen in the U.S. criminal justice system. In the vast majority of cases where an individual is accused of a crime in the United States, there is no trial, no jury, no public hearing, no proof of guilt, no evidence presented, and therefore no opportunity to challenge or rebut the evidence. This complete denial of the right to a fair public trial by a jury of one's peers is done via a procedure known as plea bargaining. In short, the accused is told that if he confesses, his punishment will be less harsh than if he demands a trial. When faced with the potential expense, embarrassment, fear, stress, and pain involved with being prosecuted by a government with virtually unlimited resources, even many innocent defendants confess, relieving those in power of having to prove guilt. Concepts such as innocent until proven guilty, having one's day in court, the state having the burden of proof, the proof needing to be beyond a reasonable doubt, and the right of the accused to not testify against himself – 
are all destroyed by threatening and intimidating a defendant into accepting a relatively lenient punishment for a crime which may never have happened. The underlying message is a very old one. Confess, whether falsely or truthfully, and your suffering shall be reduced. To make matters worse, all defendants who submit to such threats are also required to sign a statement saying that they weren't coerced into confessing. Many countries, recognizing that plea bargains amount to forced confessions, prohibit the practice. But in the United States, it is how the vast majority of criminal accusations are settled, without evidence, without a trial, without the government ever proving anything. But the ultimate contempt for due process evolved relatively recently in the U.S., with the Bush and Obama administrations claiming the right to indefinitely detain individuals without trial or charges, meaning someone could be imprisoned for life without ever being formally accused of any wrongdoing, or even if he was charged, put on trial and found not guilty. Even more drastic than that is the policy, again condoned by the Bush and Obama administrations, saying that the president has the power to issue orders to kill individuals outright, foreigners and U.S. citizens, without warrant, trial, or charges. The result of all these policies is that, notwithstanding what the Fifth Amendment says about due process, the federal government can take the property, freedom, and life of any individual it chooses without any due process at all. Related to the concept of due process is the concept of the presumption of innocence, the idea that the government may not treat people like criminals, detaining, searching, interrogating, or punishing them, unless and until there is specific evidence indicating that a crime has been committed. The Fourth Amendment prohibits unreasonable searches and seizures, and requires warrants based on probable cause and approved by a neutral judge before government agents can search one's person, belongings, or property. But again, the mere existence of words on paper does not by itself guarantee anything. Tyranny is epitomized by the image of a Nazi, KGB, or Stasi agent stopping people at random, demanding to see their papers, questioning them about where they are going and what they are doing. In sharp contrast is the image of an American having the right to be left in peace, the right to remain silent, to refuse to answer questions, and to refuse to allow himself or his property to be searched without a warrant. However, that distinction is fading, as those in power continue to invent new ways to circumvent and undermine the principle of presumption of innocence, under the guise of combating drugs, terrorism, and illegal immigration, among other things. For example, random traffic stops are now regularly performed at so-called border checkpoints that can be anywhere within a hundred miles of the border. To stop drivers at random to ask if they are in the country illegally is, in principle, no different than stopping every driver to ask if he has robbed anyone, when there is no reason to suspect that he has. Because of the Fifth Amendment, even one who has committed a crime cannot be compelled to say so. As a result, the implication of random traffic stops is that guilty people need not admit it, while innocent people may be arrested for not professing their innocence, as has already happened with people who had committed no crime being violently assaulted and charged with resisting arrest or obstructing justice simply for not cooperating with warrantless, suspicionless detention and interrogation. At so-called sobriety checkpoints, every car is stopped, briefly searched from the outside, and the driver is asked if he has been drinking. Because such stops are usually brief and minimally intrusive, and are done in the name of combating drunk driving, many people accept or even praise the practice, despite it being an obvious violation of the Fourth and Fifth Amendments. The mentality is that if it stops one drunk driver, then it is worth it. But once the premise is accepted that presumption of innocence should be abandoned in the name of safety, what argument would remain, for example, against the idea that if it prevents one violent crime or one terrorist attack, then the police should be allowed to conduct random unannounced raids of private homes, 
without even a reason for suspicion. Every totalitarian police state has grown out of such a mindset. And the tactic of detaining and interrogating people at random is not limited to traffic stops. Americans have long since grown accustomed to being questioned and having their belongings rummaged through before boarding a plane. But since 9-11-2001, anyone who wants to fly must now be subjected to an electronic strip search or a thorough physical pat-down, which in many jurisdictions fits the legal definition of sexual assault. This is the natural progression of things once a fundamental principle is abandoned. Many Americans now blithely accept being treated like criminals in the name of safety and security, being detained, interrogated, and searched without any reason to believe they have done anything wrong. And this now occurs not just at airports, but in certain housing projects, in parts of New York with the new stop-and-frisk policy, on the Houston bus system, and elsewhere. The response has been mixed, with some praising the tyrannical practice as a good way to reduce crime, and others objecting to the obvious violations of privacy and civil rights. Whether such practices will continue and expand depends largely on whether the people will tolerate it, which in turn depends upon whether the people understand and care about the basic principles of liberty. Some Americans who are still aware of their rights, when stopped and confronted by the police without cause, refuse to consent to a search or questioning, and instead ask, am I free to go or am I being detained? And if I am being detained, what is your probable cause to suspect that I have committed a crime? Even doing this, no matter how politely, often results in open hostility from the police and condemnation and insults from other Americans who view such actions as the behavior of a criminal and troublemaker. This demonstrates the growing rift between, on the one hand, those who have accepted the authoritarian attitude that one should, without question or hesitation, cooperate with whatever someone in a uniform tells them to do, and on the other hand, those Americans who still understand and respect the fundamental principles of individual liberty. The concept of presumption of innocence also implies a right to privacy regarding one's records and correspondence one's papers, as the Fourth Amendment puts it. However, the way the federal income tax is currently applied destroys the financial privacy of Americans. Based on the claim that all income, all expenses, almost every type of financial transaction is relevant to determining an individual's income tax liability, the U.S. government claims the right to demand, by way of an IRS audit, almost every type of personal financial record imaginable, without a warrant, and without even the accusation that the person has done anything wrong. And there are countless other ways in which presumption of innocence is being eroded. Warrantless spying on all sorts of communications. Agents being allowed to write their own search warrants, rendering the entire concept of a warrant pointless. So-called sneak-and-peek searches and national security letters the legality of which cannot be challenged because the ones being spied on are never told that it happened, and those who find out are threatened with imprisonment if they tell anyone else. In spite of the Fourth Amendment, today Americans are not secure in their persons, or their houses, or their papers, or their effects. The concept of presumption of innocence has been abandoned by both major political parties and by a large portion of the American public. One of the most classic signs of tyranny is when the people dare not publicly criticize their own government. But even the regimes which most violently crushed all dissent and criticism pretended to support freedom of speech. And the fact that the U.S. Constitution also mentions freedom of speech has not stopped those in power from trying to silence dissent directly and indirectly. Examples of direct censorship would include the Sedition Act of 1798, the forcible confiscation of newspapers and the arrest of news editors during the Civil War, and a second Sedition Act passed in 1918. But for the most part, those in power in the U.S. have had to rely on more subtle, indirect methods, dissuading people from speaking out using veiled or not-so-veiled threats, insults, or intimidation, and 
to create what the Supreme Court calls a chilling effect. This can take different forms, such as the government demanding that dissident groups hand over a list of their members, which was ruled unconstitutional in 1958, or federal agents monitoring certain individuals or groups, openly or covertly, based upon their political beliefs, or keeping lists of those critical of government and characterizing them as potential terrorists, or stopping and questioning people based on what their bumper stickers or t-shirts say. The goal of all such tactics is to use intimidation and harassment to discourage people from speaking their minds, or from associating with others who do. The recent demonization of all manner of groups, conservative and liberal, which have been critical of current government policies, and the herding of protesters into so-called free speech zones, are further examples of indirect attempts to silence dissent. Another tactic that is not exactly censorship but has the same goal is those in power exerting undue influence over the media by giving preferential treatment and more access to news outlets sympathetic to the agenda of those in power and using connections and influence to persuade news agencies to slant the news a certain way or to downplay or simply ignore certain events and stories. In 2005, the story broke that the Bush administration had even produced numerous propaganda pieces which were then aired in the mainstream media as if they were news reports, with the obvious goal of using what Americans imagined to be a free press to sway public opinion to favor those in power. More recently, the federal government was caught having agents create numerous fake personas to use on social media websites in an attempt to discredit those critical of the government and create the appearance of a more pro-government public opinion. Such tactics are used to weaken dissenting opinions by drowning them out with government-created pro-authoritarian messages, posing as news reports or the thoughtful opinions of concerned citizens. But despite such disinformation tactics and the attempt by those in power to publicly malign or denigrate any who oppose their agenda, for the most part, freedom of speech remains alive and well in the United States, especially in the alternative media, which now dominates the Internet, which those in power have been unable to control. Unlike the philosophical principles of limited powers, due process, and presumption of innocence, the principle of freedom of speech is still understood and cherished by nearly all Americans. Dissent and protest is, in fact, becoming more and more widespread, despite government efforts to undermine it through spying, propaganda, vilification, and intimidation. Perhaps the most conspicuous difference between the U.S. Constitution and the constitutions of other countries is found in the Second Amendment, which describes the inherent right of the people to be armed. During the founding of the country, Federalists and Anti-Federalists alike openly opined that the people should always remain armed, not merely to defend against common criminals or foreign invaders, but to retain the ability to forcibly resist their own government. An armed populace is essential to the idea that the people have the right and duty to alter or abolish any government that has become destructive of individual liberties, as the Declaration of Independence says. In contrast, the constitutions of many tyrannical regimes have claimed that all political power belongs to the people, but never gave any teeth to that idea by allowing the people themselves to remain armed. Most regimes claim a monopoly on the use of force, asserting that the police and military exist to protect the people, 
without mentioning the fact that historically what the people have most often needed protection from has been their own government. Tyrants have often pushed the idea, under the excuse of safety and preventing crime, that only the police and military should be armed. In retrospect, their motivation becomes clear. Those who seek to control and exploit a population do not want the people to have the ability to forcibly resist. For decades, some American politicians have exhibited a similar attitude. Recently, the U.S. government has dramatically escalated its attempts to disarm the general public, or at least to significantly limit the firepower possessed by the people. Even though nothing in the Constitution puts such matters under federal jurisdiction, and even though the Second Amendment specifically prohibits the federal government from enacting any so-called gun control. Twice, near Ruby Ridge, Idaho in 1992 and near Waco, Texas in 1993, the U.S. government has carried out what can only be described as violent paramilitary assaults against private citizens in their own homes, not because anyone had been threatened or harmed, but only because someone was alleged to be in possession of certain guns or gun parts, which the federal government had declared to be illegal. Randy Weaver's home was attacked. His son was shot to death. His wife was shot to death as she stood in her own home holding her baby. And Mr. Weaver and a friend were both shot but survived. The entire incident stemmed from the fact that Mr. Weaver was alleged to have sold two shotguns whose barrels were slightly shorter than allowed by law. In the Waco incident, the original paramilitary assault, the deadly shootout, the prolonged siege, the prolonged physical and emotional torture inflicted on the Branch Davidians by federal agents, and finally the fire that destroyed the entire compound, the entire incident which cost the lives of 80 American men, women, children, and babies was all the result of an unsubstantiated rumor that David Koresh was in possession of parts that could be used to convert semi-automatic firearms into fully automatic firearms. That incident occurred under the leadership of Janet Reno. With some exceptions, in the U.S., private ownership of fully automatic machine guns and various explosives has been illegal for many decades. For the past 20 years, some have been trying to ban even semi-automatic military-style rifles and the high-capacity magazines for such weapons. Not only has disarming the general public been shown to increase crime, but these particular types of weapons have never been used in more than a tiny percentage of crime yet they receive most of the attention of those in government pushing for gun control. Perhaps because such weapons, while not at all ideal for the common criminal due to being unwieldy, expensive, and difficult to conceal, are ideal for resisting an authoritarian police force or standing army. In any country, it is to be expected that those in power, those who seek out political office and believe it is their place to manage and control society, will not want those whom they control to have the means to resist those doing the controlling. Of course, those in power always claim that their motive for disarming their subjects is to preserve law and order and keep the people safe. Despite the many examples of brutal oppression which have historically followed public disarmament, those currently in power in the U.S. have managed to convince a large percentage of Americans to enthusiastically demand that they themselves be disarmed. Most Americans simply cannot imagine that their own government has any intention of violently dominating and controlling the people, just as the people of China, Russia, and Germany no doubt couldn't imagine it.
However, in addition to the recent all-out push for so-called gun control, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security recently ordered over one and a half billion rounds of ammunition, which comes to five bullets for every man, woman, and child in the country purchased by an agency that is not involved in international war, but is purely about domestic law enforcement. One does not buy such a quantity of ammunition, much of it hollow point designed to do maximum damage to the human body, unless one is planning for a large-scale armed conflict. Add to that the gradual militarization of many local and state police forces, several thousand armored vehicles ordered by Homeland Security, and, perhaps most shockingly, the admission by the top law enforcement official in the country under the Obama administration that he believes that it would be both legal and justifiable not just to kill foreigners abroad, not just to kill U.S. citizens abroad, as has already occurred, but to kill U.S. citizens on U.S. soil without charge or trial if the president decides they are a threat to government. In recent years, various flyers and memos from state and federal law enforcement agencies have surfaced showing what those in power consider to be signs that someone might be a threat. Things such as asking for the legal authority for a traffic stop, making frequent references to the Constitution or constitutional rights, concerns about loss of liberty and expanding government power, and particularly concerns about violations of the right of the people to keep and bear arms. In other words, anyone who is aware of the fundamental principles which prevent tyranny and who is concerned about the violation of those principles is, in the eyes of some in power, a potential terrorist. If at any point any group of Americans decides to resist any one of the numerous infringements on their unalienable rights going on today, as the Declaration of Independence says is their right and duty, the government can simply declare the resistors to be enemy combatants, which, according to those now in power, would justify murdering the resistors outright without charges and without a trial. Under every tyrannical regime, every new violation of civil rights was committed in the name of law. Any who disobeyed were deemed criminals, and any who forcibly resisted were called rebels, insurgents, or terrorists. Using this template, tyrants have inflicted one act of aggression after another against the people and then violently crushed any opposition or resistance that arose in the name of enforcing the law, preventing crime, and keeping order. Every law, every regulation, every policy of every government is imposed upon the people via armed enforcers. So when those in power seek to legislatively violate the fundamental principles of individual liberty, in the end, the only real guard against tyranny is the ability of the people to forcibly resist their own government. In 1776 and today, that ability relies mainly upon one thing, firearms. Despite decades of trying, U.S. politicians have, so far, failed to disarm the American people. Even the recent full-blown nationwide campaign of emotionalism and fear-mongering designed to scare the people into tolerating or even demanding public disarmament has only resulted in record numbers of firearm and ammunition sales. Those who seek dominion over others always claim that they need the power in order to protect and serve the people. Indeed, the most horrific examples of man's inhumanity to man have been done in the name of the people and the common good. The preamble of the constitution of what became the most murderous regime in history states that the Chinese people have often fought, quote, for democracy and freedom, and that after Mao's communist revolution, quote, the Chinese people took state power into their own hands and became masters of the country. Every tyrannical regime pretends to represent the very people it oppresses. The Constitution of the USSR asserted that it was the job of the Soviet government to, quote, 
ensure the maintenance of law and order, and safeguard the interests of society and the rights and freedoms of citizens. If there is one commonality among all tyrants, Mao, Stalin, Lenin, Hitler, Mussolini, Pol Pot, and countless others, it is the collectivist philosophy, the idea that it is justifiable and even noble to sacrifice the rights of the individual in the name of serving some greater good. All successful tyrants, whether politically categorized as far right or far left, built their regimes on the notion that if some authoritarian master plan benefits society as a whole, then the ends justify the means, and individual rights can and should be ignored. This idea is the antithesis of the concept of unalienable rights and individual freedom. Collectivism, whether it takes the form of communism, socialism, nationalism, fascism, or even democracy, has been used over and over again as the excuse for violent oppression. And over and over again, people have fallen for collectivist ideas because on the surface they sound altruistic and noble. An individual can feel good about giving up some of what is his to benefit his neighbor, his community, or his country, to be part of something greater than himself. But there is a fundamental difference between, on the one hand, someone voluntarily choosing to help his fellow man and to cooperate for mutual benefit, and on the other hand, having the state force individuals into doing whatever those in power say is for the common good. The former is the basis of a civil society. The latter is always the basis for tyranny. Government, by its very nature, is not about voluntary cooperation. It is about a ruling class legislating a central plan, forcing the people to comply, and punishing any who don't conform. But tyrants have learned that the best way to trick someone into tolerating his own subjugation is to convince him that it will somehow benefit his fellow man, or society as a whole. Every tyrant uses this lie to exploit the compassion and virtues of the common people in order to enslave them in the name of the common good. At the founding of the United States, there was a fundamentally different idea, the idea that the only legitimate purpose of government is to protect and defend the rights of individuals. The idea that peace, prosperity, and justice come not from an authoritarian ruling class controlling and micromanaging society, but from free and equal individuals trading and cooperating voluntarily, each free to do as he pleases, provided he does not infringe on the rights of others. In fact, all of the principles which prevent tyranny are merely extensions of the idea that every human being has a right to live, to be free, and to pursue his own happiness in whatever way he sees fit, and that the good of society is best served by recognizing and respecting the human rights of every individual. In contrast, collectivism teaches that it is permissible, even desirable, that every individual be controlled, taxed, monitored, regulated, censored, disarmed, and subjugated in whatever way and to whatever degree the rulers say will best serve the nation. Though historical tyrannies have varied regarding racial, religious, economic, territorial, and cultural issues, every one of them, left and right, shared the idea that it is justifiable to sacrifice the rights of the individual at the altar of the collective, a truly dangerous idea which both major political parties in the U.S. 
and those who vote for them have now adopted. Indeed, the political speeches of modern American politicians contain rhetoric very similar to that used by the infamous tyrants of history. To a large degree, America has abandoned the idea of unalienable rights and individual liberty and has embraced instead the philosophy of tyrants, collectivism. Today, the Jeffersonian view of unalienable individual rights is a completely foreign concept to most Americans. And history shows that once the people themselves have forsaken the primary philosophical principle which prevents tyranny, freedom and justice will not long survive. Every tyrant tells his subjects that if they will just give up their freedom in favor of authoritarian power, then he can protect them from all the dangers and uncertainties of life including economic troubles, crime, and especially foreign enemies. One tyrant after another has inflicted drastic injustice and hardship on his own people in the name of protecting them against some evil outside threat, whether that threat was genuine or exaggerated or simply made up. The blind nationalism and tolerance of domestic surveillance and oppression, which comes from being at war, has enabled many tyrants to get away with extreme brutality. The latest excuse for perpetual war is to spread democracy around the world. But regardless of the exact excuse, once the fear-mongering and war propaganda is in full gear, most dare not resist with words or actions for fear of being perceived as traitors or cowards or even worse, sympathizers with the enemy. As the head of the Nazi Gestapo put it, quote, Naturally, the common people don't want war, but after all, it is the leaders of the country who determine policy, and it is always a simple matter to drag the people along, whether it is a democracy or a fascist dictatorship or a parliament or a communist dictatorship. All you have to do is to tell them they are being attacked and denounce the pacifists for lack of patriotism and exposing the country to danger. This tactic has been effective for many centuries, exploiting the natural pack mentality of human beings. The us versus them mentality has always been an effective tool for tyrants in duping the people into showing blind loyalty to their political masters and tolerating all manner of injustice and oppression from their own government. And rather than waiting around to be attacked, tyrants will instigate violent conflicts while playing the part of the innocent victim in order to use foreign war as an excuse for domestic tyranny. Even Plato described this tactic 2,000 years ago. The founders of the United States were also well aware that war is often used as an excuse for oppression. Often, tyrants have used propaganda and false flag operations to start a war as an excuse to claim more power for themselves. It is highly likely, for example, that the Nazis themselves burned down the Reichstag, their own parliament building, in order to blame their enemies as an excuse to curtail civil rights and institute martial law. They also carried out Operation Himmler, in which Nazi agents staged elaborate events to appear as attacks on Germany by Poland, immediately after which Hitler invaded Poland, claiming it was an act of defense, saying he would fight, quote, until the safety of the Reich and its rights are secured. 
Every warmonger knows that to win public support, he must play the part of reluctant fighter who goes to war only when absolutely necessary in order to defend truth and justice from foreign evildoers. Such rhetoric works simply because people never want to imagine that their own leaders are malicious warmongers who would intentionally cause unnecessary suffering and death, and this leaves the people very receptive to the propaganda fed to them by their own governments. Recently declassified documents show that under the presidency of John F. Kennedy, the entire Joint Chiefs of Staff approved a series of covert military actions, collectively known as Operation Northwoods, whereby the U.S. government would stage fake terrorist actions, including on U.S. soil, and blame Fidel Castro for the events in order to win public support for a military invasion of Cuba. The documents went into detail describing plans to attack U.S. military ships, stage mock hijackings or the shooting down of civilian airliners, and so on. While this particular operation was not carried out, the documents give a clear view of the deceptive, warmongering mentality of some of the highest officials in the United States military and government, who plan to commit false flag terrorist actions in order to deceive the American public into demanding war. While the documents clearly proving this are publicly available, few Americans know about it, and the mainstream American media has given the matter only brief mention, allowing most Americans to comfortably but mistakenly assume that their government would never engage in the types of deception, propaganda, emotional manipulation, false flag terrorism, and warmongering that so many other regimes have been known to engage in. So how are people to tell the difference between honest leaders fighting against real threats and would-be tyrants using deception and public fear to empower themselves and enslave the people? The answer is quite simple. If those in power seek to preserve the fundamental principles of liberty, they can probably be trusted. But if their solution is to sacrifice and violate those principles, then they are tyrants no matter what excuses or rationalizations they try to hide behind. Those who have been brought up to feel loyalty to their nation are often incapable of seeing history and world events in any objective sort of way. For example, most Americans view the prolonged bombing of London by the German Luftwaffe during World War II, with its 40,000 civilian deaths, as a cowardly, heinous atrocity, but view the nuclear annihilation of Nagasaki and Hiroshima by the U.S. military as righteous acts of defense, despite the latter killing four times as many civilians as the former, and about 70 times the number killed on 9-11-2001. The victors write the history books, and every empire reports events in the light most favorable to itself. Facts or events that do not serve the positive image of the regime are downplayed, distorted, or simply ignored. Few Americans are aware of the horrible devastation, with over 20,000 civilians killed, from the tactically pointless firebombing of Dresden in 1945 by U.S. and British air forces or the firebombing of Tokyo in the same year, which killed upwards of 100,000 civilians. In every country, children are taught that their nation is great and noble, and that their leaders are courageous and virtuous. State propaganda always seeks to muddle together the concepts of love of one's country on the one hand, and blind loyalty to the nation's ruling class on the other. This tends to make the people passive, subservient, and easily controlled by those in power, 
and makes people use an extreme double standard when judging the morality of government actions. During the Vietnam War, Americans who spoke out against sending young men off to fight and die, and even those who protested outright atrocities committed by U.S. troops, such as occurred at My Lai, were often accused by other Americans of hating America, as if the noble and patriotic thing to do during a time of national conflict is to turn a blind eye to any evil done by one's own countrymen. As a more recent example of the nationalistic love-it-or-leave-it mentality, many Americans view Bradley Manning as a traitor for leaking evidence of U.S. troops committing murder. And when images surfaced of American soldiers openly delighting in the torturing and suffering of helpless prisoners, and when the details of the torture committed at the behest of the U.S. government in the Extraordinary Rendition program became widely known, many Americans, in government and out, downplayed the findings or tried to justify and excuse them. Almost without fail, those same Americans vehemently condemn as barbaric and unforgivable torture committed by other regimes. People around the world have, all too often, shown more loyalty to a particular flag than to morality and justice. Nationalistic bias can also be seen in the fact that all American schoolchildren have heard the name Adolf Hitler and associate it with evil and tyranny, but many know nothing about Mao Zedong or Joseph Stalin, each of whom headed regimes which murdered far more people than Hitler's Third Reich. The difference is that the U.S. government had open alliances, military or economic, with Mao and Stalin, but not with Hitler. Even though Stalin was an ally of Hitler at the start of World War II, after he later switched sides, the American media and the U.S. government began characterizing the second worst mass murderer in history as Uncle Joe Stalin, because it didn't serve those in Washington to have the American people seeing their new ally as the murderous dictator he was, or knowing about the heinous atrocities committed by his armies. Likewise, despite the British Empire's long history of widespread brutal imperialism in India, parts of Africa, and elsewhere, including in the American colonies, most Americans have been taught to have a generally positive view of England, simply because maintaining the image that one's own government is noble and virtuous requires maintaining the belief that the allies of one's government are noble and virtuous. Nationalistic bias can be seen regarding domestic oppression as well. Despite the countless cases of American police being caught lying under oath, planning evidence, intimidating, harassing, threatening, assaulting, and sometimes even murdering unarmed civilians, and despite the fact that whenever this happens, other police officers and departments invariably attempt to downplay, cover up, or even excuse such abuses— Many Americans still believe that American law enforcement is on the side of freedom and justice, except for a few bad apples. No matter how many instances of police brutality and corruption come to light, many Americans insist on believing that those are the exception rather than the rule. Yet when they see similar behavior from police forces in other countries, they have no problem recognizing it as oppression. What Americans imagine to be the freest country on earth has the highest incarceration rate in the world, with well over two million individuals currently caged, most of them for victimless crimes, a number far higher even than are imprisoned in communist China, despite China having a total population over four times that of the U.S. Americans tend to view the killing of unarmed protesters in Tiananmen Square in 1989 as typical and representative of the nature of the Chinese government, but view the killing of four unarmed student protesters at Kent State in 1970 by the Ohio National Guard as an unfortunate fluke. They may view the execution of the members of the White Rose, a German group concerned with the growing tyranny of the Nazi government, as a sign of a truly oppressive regime, while viewing the armed paramilitary assault and slaughter of the Branch Davidians, a group concerned with the growing tyranny of the U.S. government, as a regrettable error in judgment. 
Even more dramatically, many of the same Americans who recognize and righteously condemn the forced eviction and mass murder of the Jews by the Third Reich say little or nothing about the forced eviction and mass murder of the American Indians by the U.S. government. While this has finally begun to change, for many years in America, one example of racial genocide was solemnly remembered as the low point in human history, while the other was romanticized and glorified in books and movies, and even by little children playing cowboys and Indians. The point is not that all authoritarian atrocities and injustices have been the same in scale or severity. The point is that one's nationality tends to make one more likely to forgive and forget evils perpetrated by those wearing his flag, and more likely to condemn and remember the evils committed under other flags. And this phenomenon has been a huge help to tyrants around the world, whose subjects have been quick to judge foreign dictators, but slow to recognize and criticize injustices committed by their own rulers. It is easy for Americans to be judgmental about those Russians who still revere Lenin and Stalin as great and noble leaders, and those Chinese who still glorify and praise Mao Zedong. But the people of every nation are taught to view themselves and their leaders as virtuous and enlightened, while viewing the subjects of other regimes as ignorant, indoctrinated, and brainwashed. Consider the example of Abraham Lincoln still revered in the U.S. as the great emancipator, fighter for truth, liberty, and justice. By any objective measure, Lincoln's actions showed him to be a vicious tyrant, with no respect for individual rights or for the Constitution. American children are rightly taught about the evils of slavery, but are then taught, implicitly if not explicitly, that it was righteous for Lincoln to do whatever he had to in order to end slavery, even though that was not the primary reason for the war. Tyrants throughout history have used the narrow, simplistic, good guys versus bad guys mindset to imply that if one's enemy is evil, then whatever one has to do to fight that enemy must be justified. And in the name of saving the Union, Lincoln violated every fundamental principle of liberty and justice. Not only does nothing in the Constitution authorize the use of military might to forcibly prevent states from leaving the Union, but where military force is to be used, it is Congress, not the President, empowered by the Constitution to declare war, which never happened during the Civil War. Furthermore, under the Constitution, only Congress may appropriate funds for military actions. President Lincoln simply stole the funds to carry out his own dictatorial military occupation of the states which sought only to peacefully secede and become independent. Instead of allowing that, Lincoln single-handedly started a war that killed over 600,000 Americans— more than died in World War I, World War II, and Vietnam combined. The Civil War was also the first time that the federal government used military conscription, forcing tens of thousands of men to kill or die for the Union. The Confederacy did likewise, triggering much criticism and resistance. It is ironic that Lincoln is now known as the man who ended involuntary servitude even though he forcibly conscripted and enslaved thousands of individuals not to pick cotton, but to engage in mortal combat, and in many cases to suffer and die. This set the precedent that the government may enslave people as unwilling mercenaries whenever it wishes, which it has done on several occasions since then, a practice as antithetical to individual liberty as any could possibly be. In a glaring violation of freedom of speech, Lincoln also forcibly seized newspapers in the North and arrested newspaper editors critical of his actions. He also violated the principle of habeas corpus, ordering thousands of non-combatants, including hundreds of women, to be forcibly taken hostage without warrant or trial, without even the accusation that they had committed any crime. 
At Lincoln's bidding, Union forces also engaged in widespread theft, vandalism, and terrorism in the South against civilians as well as combatants. In essence, Abraham Lincoln did what Mao, Stalin, and Hitler would later do, unilaterally claiming dictatorial powers, violently crushing opposition and dissent, and violating every fundamental principle of liberty and justice in the name of uniting the country. And yet he is still all but deified by most Americans as a great and noble leader and savior. And other U.S. presidents are also still glorified, despite the oppressions they inflicted on the people. From the beginning of the country and continuing for many decades, the government's treatment of Native Americans and of black slaves constituted an obvious drastic violation of unalienable rights by way of widespread harassment, assault, torture, enslavement, and murder. Other, more isolated abuses have been occurring from the beginning. John Adams, the second president of the U.S., signed into law the Sedition Act, which essentially made it a crime to criticize government, an obvious and gross violation of the First Amendment, just seven years after the Bill of Rights was enacted. During World War II, the principles of due process and presumption of innocence were blatantly violated by FDR when he ordered the imprisoning of over 100,000 people of Japanese descent, most of them U.S. citizens, without charge or trial, based solely on their ancestry. This was done dictator-style, by unilateral executive order, without any constitutional basis for doing so though it was done with the blessing of the Supreme Court. Concerning the concept of limited federal powers, both FDR and LBJ, in the name of the New Deal and the Great Society, demolished the concept of a limited government, expanding federal control into the fields of education, transportation, health care, retirement, and welfare, among others, matters which the Constitution never put under federal jurisdiction. Indeed, the presidents who have done the most to destroy the principles of liberty are the ones most usually praised and adored today and seen as great progressive leaders. As a result, nearly all of the principles described in the Bill of Rights are now violated every day in every state in the Union. Concerning the right of the people to be armed, perhaps the most glaring violation occurred relatively recently, when, in New Orleans, in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, police and military went door-to-door, forcibly disarming innocent civilians, without warrant, without probable cause, without anything in the Constitution authorizing such actions. Despite all of these examples and countless others that could be given, Americans still refer to the U.S. as a free country. All evidence to the contrary, no matter how overt or appalling, is usually dismissed either under the excuse that those were just isolated, unfortunate exceptions, or even more commonly under the excuse that other regimes have been even more vicious and brutal. While quite true, resorting to such an argument amounts to conceding that America is not free, while arguing it should nonetheless be unconditionally praised and never characterized as oppressive or tyrannical, based solely on the fact that other empires have been worse. In this way, legitimate objection and dissent is squelched through shaming or intimidation by other Americans who believe that pointing out genuine injustice and tyranny in one's own country is unpatriotic, if not traitorous. Most of the fundamental philosophical principles which serve as a check against tyranny have been abandoned by nearly all U.S. politicians and voters. Americans have been scared into surrendering their basic rights in the name of safety and security, as has happened under so many other authoritarian regimes. The threat of war, terrorism, crime, poverty, and economic troubles have been used by America's political elite just as they have been used by foreign tyrants to intimidate the people into tolerating, and in many cases demanding, a level of government power and control that has virtually no limits. 
Many Americans now openly beg for government control of nearly everything without even realizing it because they have grown ignorant and have become convinced that more power for the rulers means more security for the people, the lie on which all tyrannies are based. Being unaware of the fundamental principles of freedom and their importance, most Americans have willingly, eagerly given them up to whatever politician promised to protect them and take care of them. The progression of the United States Empire, with its ever-expanding government power and ever-contracting individual freedom, is following the same general path that every tyrannical regime in history has. In terms of economics, the U.S. is less free than Hong Kong, Australia, Switzerland, and Canada, among others. While quantitating overall freedom is very difficult, most attempts to do so rank the United States in 10th place or lower and headed down. Every government puts out propaganda telling the people that they are free, that their country is the best, and that a strong government means a strong country. In reality, government power is always inversely proportional to individual freedom. Despite wishful thinking to the contrary, it can happen here. It already did happen here. It continues to happen here, and the situation is only getting worse. If America was ever special and different, it is no more, because the mentality and philosophy of the American people is no longer different. The perpetual bickering for handouts from the rulers, individuals and groups all begging for state power to be used to serve their interests at the expense of someone else, each clamoring for collectivist programs and benefits for themselves, and more restrictions and punishments for others. In a society where nearly everything is already taxed, regulated, controlled, and monitored, these are the symptoms of a defeated and conquered subject class, not a free people. Americans hallucinate freedom while everything they eat and drink, where they can live, what they can drive, what work they can do, what they can build, is all restricted and regulated. Children's lemonade stands shut down by the police. Armed paramilitary raids of food co-ops and small farms. Kidnapping and caging of people for growing a certain plant. A fee, permit, or license required to own a dog, to sell cookies, to build a deck, to braid hair, to catch a fish, to get married, to grow vegetables and still that persistent lie about a free country. Some who have never personally been arrested, harassed, or assaulted by government agents attempt to treat that as proof that the U.S. is not at all tyrannical. This claim ignores the fact that most people living in Nazi Germany were never arrested, assaulted, or directly harassed by government agents, nor were most of those living in the Soviet Union or China. Even under the most vicious regimes in history, the majority of those who did as they were told and who quietly allowed themselves to be robbed of the fruits of their labor in order to fund the police state and the war machine had little trouble from those in power, and many lived relatively safe, comfortable lives. In most cases, only those with the conscience and courage to speak out or act out against injustice have been subjected to the overt brutality of totalitarianism. Of course, different empires have carried out different injustices. The point is not that the degree of oppression in the U.S. is the same as what occurred in Nazi Germany, Soviet Russia, or Communist China. Obviously, it is not. The point is that, regardless of the precise scale and level of brutality, a regime which can forcibly control all manner of choices and behaviors which can secretly spy on its citizens without warrants, which imprisons millions for victimless crimes, a regime whose police can stop, detain, search, interrogate, cage, assault, even murder people without even any suspicion of criminal activity, and get away with it, whether that is done to 10 people or 10 million, that is tyranny. And once the precedent has been set that such actions are tolerated by the people, that those who perpetrate such acts are rewarded instead of punished, 
that there is no recourse against such injustice via the legal system, then it is inevitable that such actions will increase in frequency and severity. The degree of violence and brutality which the U.S. government inflicts upon the American people may be less than that of other authoritarian regimes, but the fundamental nature of the empire is the same, because the basic philosophical principles that prevent tyranny have been forsaken and forgotten by those in power and even by most of the victims of state extortion and oppression. If history is any indication, the brutality and violence of the empire will continue to increase unless and until the people choose to stop it. The United States has followed the same pattern as many nations, starting with relative freedom, growing economically, then having the government getting more powerful in military might around the world and in the ability to exploit and control its own people, with ever-increasing taxation and regulation. Historically, the growth of state power and the simultaneous shrinking of liberty continues until economic or political collapse or revolution stops it. But is there any other way to prevent the steady, predictable march toward totalitarianism? Americans are taught to believe that their ability to vote means that they are free, but the subjects of many authoritarian regimes had and still have the ability to vote, which has consistently failed to prevent widespread brutal tyranny and mass murder. Like many tyrants, Adolf Hitler was elected into power in Germany, and later the people of Austria voted overwhelmingly to accept annexation by the Third Reich, demonstrating that if the people themselves forsake the principles of liberty, their ability to vote will do nothing to prevent totalitarianism. In the U.S., as elsewhere, often the candidates who enjoy the strongest public support and the past politicians who are now most respected and revered are the ones who violated the principles of liberty most boldly and dramatically. Today, candidates from both major parties give lip service to the concept of unalienable rights, but betray and violate it in almost every action they take. Americans may scoff at the facade of democracy that existed in the Soviet Union because the right to vote is obviously meaningless when there's only one party on the ballot. However, being given the choice between two candidates, neither of whom has any respect for the principles which prevent tyranny, may strengthen the facade that elections matter, but still renders the ability to vote a useless tool against totalitarianism. The only presidential candidate for decades who showed true loyalty to the basic principles of liberty was openly hated, scorned, ridiculed, vilified, slandered, and suppressed by both major parties, by the entire political establishment, and by the mainstream media. Whenever there is a powerful elite that chooses the candidates offered to the public, whether the powers that be offer up one candidate, two, or ten, Voting can never be an effective way to prevent tyranny. Many Americans understand that pure democracy, which is simply mob rule, can lead to tyranny, but imagine that having a democratic constitutional republic prevents it. But the most brutal regimes in history began as democratic constitutional republics, the People's Republic of China, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, and the Weimar Republic, out of which Nazi power grew. Without a firm adherence to the fundamental principles of liberty, the particular structure of the ruling class does nothing to prevent widespread oppression and injustice. Indeed, the degree of oppression in the American colonies under the rule of a king was, in terms of taxation, regulation, intrusion, and interference, far less than what is now done to the American people by their own supposedly limited, democratically chosen, constitutional, republican form of government. The country which was designed to have the most limited pro-liberty government ever, because it has abandoned most of the fundamental principles of freedom, 
has become the most powerful authoritarian empire in history, with the biggest standing army, the biggest taxing machine, and the most intrusive regulatory system in the world, all things the Constitution was supposed to prevent, making it plain that having a Constitution, allowing elections, and having a Republican form of government does not prevent tyranny. Many believe that the only proper, civilized way to combat tyranny is through political action, by getting involved in the process, campaigning, running for office, supporting this or that candidate or party. However, the track record of such political action warding off oppression and tyranny has been a dismal failure, largely because tyranny, at least at first, nearly always has the support of a well-intentioned but deceived and misinformed public. Whenever a majority falls for the promises of some new would-be ruler pitching state power and control under the guise of the pleasant-sounding collectivist philosophy, the inevitable result cannot be avoided by having the minority playing the game of electoral politics. In the U.S., since before the ink was even dry on the Constitution, there were individuals and groups ardently trying to preserve freedom and prevent tyranny. Even the Constitution itself was a victory for those preferring more centralized government control and a defeat for the anti-federalists who voiced concern that the principles of individual liberty were already in danger. Patrick Henry, for example, refused to attend the Constitutional Convention, famously saying, I smell a rat. For well over 200 years since then, various well-meaning individuals and groups have enthusiastically lobbied, petitioned, campaigned, and voted, trying to defend the concepts of individual liberty against the steady encroachments of increasing government power. Through it all, the size and scope of government control expanded and personal liberty decreased. Other than a few tiny, temporary blips, the hard work of countless political activists who poured their hearts and souls into seeking a political remedy not only failed to return the country to constitutional principles, but even failed to break even, to at least hold authoritarian power and control at existing levels. Common sense dictates that when those in power are the ones making the rules, playing by the rules will not protect the people from tyranny. Freedom advocates who limit themselves to working within the system, when the system was designed and built by those who crave dominion over others, ultimately have no chance of success. History bears that out in the U.S. and elsewhere. While Americans value their First Amendment rights, the truth is that the ability to complain and protest in and of itself does little or nothing to prevent tyranny. The right on paper to criticize the government did not stop Chinese troops from massacring unarmed protesters in Tiananmen Square. It did not prevent the brutal crushing of all dissent and protest in North Korea. It did not stop Stalin from murdering millions of his critics and political opponents. Whenever there is a contest between the words of dissenters and the guns of government enforcers, tyranny wins and freedom loses. Elections, political action, petitions, and protests are all tactics designed to try to persuade those in power to change their ways, to alter their laws. All such tactics, everything that can be done within the realm of politics, amounts to asking nicely for those with power to show mercy and restraint and to grant their legislative permission for the people to be free. But tyrants have never been swayed by polite requests for justice and mercy. Indeed, through all of history, little or nothing has been accomplished by those who have begged for justice and appealed to the consciences of those in power. Even those making the most well-reasoned, heartfelt pleas were, at best, simply ignored, and at worst, murdered. No tyrannical regime has ever been ended by people politely asking for justice. In short, the only thing that has ever prevented tyranny has been outright disobedience and resistance. 
The countless well-meaning individuals who have believed that the moral and civilized way to affect political change is to vote, petition, and beg for reform while continuing to obey the edicts of their rulers have done little or nothing to prevent tyranny. History shows all too clearly that only those capable of contemplating direct disobedience and resistance against their own government have ever actually prevented or ended tyranny. The resistance may be nonviolent, as in the case of the movement led by Gandhi in India, or it may be violent, as in the case of the American Revolution. And the methods of disobedience and resistance may vary. For example, the injustice of legally enforced slavery in the United States was undone largely by the Underground Railroad and by jurors refusing to convict defendants prosecuted under fugitive slave laws. But ultimately, because any injustice can be enacted as law, the only thing that has ever prevented tyranny, or even slowed it down significantly, is a people willing to disobey those who wear the label of authority. The subjects of every authoritarian empire are taught that if one disagrees with the law or believes the government's actions to be unjust, the proper civilized response is to obey authority and comply with the law while humbly asking those in power to change the law. But such an attitude is in direct opposition to the sentiment expressed in the Declaration of Independence, that when any government becomes a violator rather than a protector of individual liberty, the people have the right and the duty to alter or abolish that government. Despite the pride many people feel at being law-abiding citizens, the truth is that only those willing to directly combat injustices done in the name of authority and law have ever been an impediment to the would-be tyrants of the world. But to most Americans today, criticism and protest is seen as proper and noble, but actual disobedience is simply unthinkable. Unfortunately, people with such a mindset pose no obstacle at all to complete totalitarianism. Some hope for liberty and some spirit of resistance is now coming from a seemingly unlikely source, government enforcers. A number of U.S. soldiers and law enforcers have pledged not to participate in disarming the American people, in detaining people without charges, or in other violations of individual rights. Members of the U.S. military all pledge an oath not to serve the politicians, but to protect and defend the Constitution from all enemies, foreign and domestic. Recently, more and more men and women in uniform have been taking that oath seriously. Needless to say, the quickest and least destructive way for a tyrannical agenda to be ended is for the government's own enforcers to refuse to inflict injustice upon the people. But if that does not occur, if the state's enforcers will follow orders without question, then freedom will only survive if the people have not only the will to disobey, but the means to forcibly resist state aggression. Because every government uses force against the disobedient, that leaves the people with only four choices. Submit and obey, be caged or killed, run and hide, or forcibly resist. The last of which can be done successfully only if the people possess the weaponry needed to combat the violence of the state. It was with that in mind that the Second Amendment was penned. But when it comes to violent conflict, thugs and tyrants have one big advantage. Those who crave power and dominion have no qualms about using violence to impose their will upon others, while peaceful, moral people tend to hesitate to use physical force, even in righteous self-defense. The pages of history books are full of examples of decent people passively cooperating with tyranny, reluctant to even engage in non-violent civil disobedience, much less forcible resistance, and paying for their tolerance, endurance, and patience with their lives. <laughs>
The only people who have ever defeated tyrants are those who are able and willing to disobey the masters. Most of the large-scale injustices of history were inflicted upon people who, for the most part, did not resist because they had been taught to value obedience to authority above liberty and justice. Only a people with a fundamentally different attitude and mindset should expect a different outcome. As much as some people want to believe in American exceptionalism, want to believe that the U.S. is the freest country on earth, and want to believe that tyranny could never happen here, the facts tell a very different story. The very principles and ideas that prevent tyranny have long since been abandoned and are now ridiculed and hated by nearly everyone in power and by nearly all American voters. Tyranny cannot be forced on a people that understands and believes in individual liberty. Instead, in almost every case, tyranny has been enacted with the blessing and support of the people. Tyrants who rise to power usually do so surrounded by cheering, excited, adoring masses, not because people are malicious or evil, but simply because they are ignorant ignorant of history and ignorant of philosophy, and as a result, easily seduced by the empty promises of authoritarian collectivism. Modern Americans are no different. Imagining themselves to be thinking and informed, they are following the same path that so many other empires have followed, the path to subservience, oppression, and ruin. And usually those who follow that path do not see the path they are on until they reach its end. Avoiding that fate cannot be accomplished by tinkering around the edges of a fundamentally authoritarian, collectivist regime. Even most voters recognize that all they are doing is trying to choose the lesser of two evils. Yet they dare not do anything else, because the spirit of resistance, the love of real freedom, the respect for unalienable rights has been trained out of the hearts and minds of most Americans. Relative comfort and prosperity has rendered most Americans passive and docile, unwilling and unable to risk what they have to actively resist the injustices they see, when they see them at all. History makes it perfectly clear that there is no document, no system, no election, no political procedure that can prevent tyranny. In the end, the path society will take is determined solely by what resides in the hearts and minds of the people. A population content to perpetually bicker over authoritarian control, each seeking to use government to control and extort his neighbors, to force his values and preferences onto others, will sooner or later descend into tyranny. Only a population which understands and loves the concepts of self-ownership and self-determination, only a population that yearns for a world of equals, interacting voluntarily with no masters and no slaves, with an unflinching and uncompromising loyalty to the principle of individual liberty, can ever know true peace, justice, and freedom. Which road America takes remains to be seen. <laughs>